and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated. What a great way to start our morning. So thank you, um, Jane and your friends. And let me tell you, we don't mind having this every morning. I mean, every Sunday morning. When you can. That's nice. Well, and, uh, warm welcome to anyone uh, worshiping with us for the first time. Those who have been away or been unwell, welcome to our space of worship. And it's nice to join together again in offering our, our service of worship.
Let us pray. Miraculous God, come to us now. Come into our hearts. Even as your Son came to those first disciples on the shores of Galilee, speak your peace to our hearts. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Reveal your word that we may hear your message this day and live as your disciples in the days and years to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Your spirit of glory. We ask that we may learn how to truly be Easter people, 
And always remember that we are celebrating <coughs> Resurrection Day and every day. <coughs> Gracious God, you give to us your greatest gift. You give to us your great, greatest gift, your Son, Jesus Christ, as we still don't understand what is going on. <clears throat> you call us to be people of courage and hope, and yet we run and hide, doubting and fearing. You challenge us to proclaim our faith, but we huddle in darkness, whispering our words of discouragement. Shake us up, Lord. Forgive us when we seem to need bottling over and over again. Help us to see the presence of Jesus in our lives and remind us of all that he taught us to help us to live as disciples, serving you by serving others. Change us. Remote us, make us truly the disciples you have called us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> do not be afraid, words of assurance, do not be afraid. The light of God has vanished, the darkness, Christ is risen. Doubts are erased, rejoice, God's love is poured out upon you, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, I prepared a sermon for the kids, but like we've always said, we are young at heart. It's good to um, have a while again, making noises, which is nice. All right. Um, what makes you happy this morning? Just waking up. Just waking up, yes. <laughs> That's hard work. <laughs> um, to be honest, last year, all of our Australian rugby teams were terrible. This year, they're doing very well. That makes me happy. <laughs> I can see a smiling face about the cat skating last night or the night before. Did, tonight? Oh, okay. What else? What else that makes you happy? Autumn leaves. Autumn leaves. It's beautiful colours. Oh, yes. Breath for fresh air. Thanks again. Like I said, we don't mind you having it. Anything else? Like those people have been away? Put up your hand. <laughs> yes, it's nice to be here safely. So. Yes, that makes us a happy community when everything's went well. Any other things? What about the noise of the child, the babies? We, yeah, we have that in our churches, but it's so nice to have that. Makes us happy. Yes? Going to Melbourne today to celebrate our granddaughter's second birthday. Yes, celebrating people's birthday, granddaughter's second birthday. That makes us happy. Next generations are coming up, families growing. All right. Um, I also have a song that comes with it.
something that's inspiring to all of us, and that's the love of God. And that's what I was meant to tell you. It comes with the actions. So, and are you a question? Yes. No, there's so much. We go back to song. Mo. Hey, buddy. Excuse me. Maybe, uh, maybe a seamus. A seamus, you want to join me and do the actions? I just want to hold a job and what about all of you? All right. You know, have you seen me? Good girl. All right, so let's play that. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. 
Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how so hard to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They would say, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Was there a time in your life where you were totally unrecognisable? Maybe. And my first question, I used to wear the white cam, you know, the white cam. The excitement of an exit student to wear that, that, that was my experience. So I wore it every Sunday. But during the week, we would go on a walk alongside the river. And we got to meet our parishioners there. Some of them just walked past us. And I thought, what's going on here? So sometimes I had to call out, what is going on here? And people would just look at back and say, oh, it's you. They recognize me in the white camp, but they don't recognize me in my everyday clothes. At the Senate meeting last year, I got to pe uh, meet people from the Presbytery of Western Victoria. I know some of them very well, and vice versa. I was smiling at them, I was sitting at my table, looking at their table in the distance, and I could see that they are trying to work out who I was. Um, and there was this minister who knew me from the beginning of my journey. He walked past me and I thought he would stop, but he kept going. But a few steps away he stopped, he came back and said, Oh, it's you! Last time I saw you, your hair was black. <laughs> They made me feel like I drank something and here it is, turned white. It's good to know that I can be invisible sometimes, so be careful. Might see you on the street. <laughs> the two disciples returned home from Jerusalem after hearing that Jesus came back to life. While they were walking and talking about what had happened to Jesus, a stranger just came out of nowhere and joined them on the walk home. As we know, the stranger is the reason Christ, but they did not recognize him. What's going on here? Did Jesus change his clothes? Did he turn white after the resurrection? Anyways, the stranger asked, What are you two discussing? They replied, are you the only Jew that doesn't know what happened in the last few days? What things? Jesus asked. So they told him the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. So when they arrived home, uh, they urged Jesus, this stranger, to come home with them. So Jesus, the stranger, 
went inside their home with him. They prepared him a meal, and Jesus sat at the table. He took bread, he blessed it, and then he broke the bread. Just like that. And Luke tells us that disciples' eyes were open with amazement. Oh my God, it's Jesus. This is my impression of the two disciples when Jesus broke bread. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jesus disappeared. That's what Luke tells us. Jesus broke bread, disciples' eyes were open, and then he vanished. What is going on here? If we take everything that the Bible says literally, we will do more harm than good to ourselves. The story is simply telling us that the risen Christ is no longer recognized by his appearances. The clothes he wears, the length of his hair, the color of his skin, but by his actions. When he broke bread, the eyes of the disciples were opened, and then they recognized Jesus. The most expensive painting ever sold in auction was the painting of Jesus by Leonardo da Vinci. Here it is. It was sold for $450 million. <laughs> That's crazy. In 2017, more than enough to feed thousands of hungry people a year. It raises uh, questions in my mind. Whenever we mention Jesus' name, whether it's in prayer or when you're frustrated, you know, sometimes it's, oh, Jesus. <laughs> we all do. Like, it's natural because our brains are programmed that way. When we say names, the face appears in a screen somewhere in our heads. But the question is, what image or identity of Jesus comes to mind when we mention Jesus' name? It's important to have a name to face. But sometimes it's very difficult when you haven't met the person before. We haven't met Jesus before in person. That's a reality. One of the challenges of conducting funerals of people that I never met was I have, I have no idea what they look like. Especially I have had no memories of them at all. So how do I deal with that? Well, I just simply paint the image of the person from memories of the family with words of hope and prayers for comfort. It's the least that any funeral um, celebrant can do to, to keep the family's uh, comfort. At that point, for me, what the people look like is no longer important, but the memories that will be left behind. Memories that will inspire and motivate the family to keep going because such life is worth living. It's amazing how Christians continue to follow and be inspired by a Savior that they have never met in their life. That's including us. It's good and it's, uh, it's inspiring as long as we know which Jesus we're talking about. When you hear an expression from other Christians, they sounded like they had breakfast with Jesus in the morning before they met you. They would be saying something, hey, my friend, I just had breakfast with Jesus at Magnus, and he told me to tell you to give your heart to him. You know that kind of expression? I'm not sure where it's helpful at all. But which Jesus are they talking about? The $450 million that collects dust on the wall? The account of resurrection from the Gospel of Luke is simply presenting a different picture of Jesus. Last Sunday in the Gospel of John, Thomas did not believe that his, what his friends told him that Jesus came back to life. Thomas said no. 
unless I put my finger in the wounds of Jesus, I will never believe. Again, John also paints a different understanding of Jesus after the resurrection. This is no longer the Jesus that used to walk with the disciples and literally share the meal with them. But this is the Jesus that can only be recognized by his actions and his deeds. Just as he broke bread and shared with his friends. Just as he laid down his life on the cross for others. Just as he touched the lepers, the outcasts, the lost, the blind and healed them. Just as he fed the hungry and forgives the sinners. That's the Jesus that we should recognize. Recognize by actions. We are the reflections of the risen Christ. We are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world, Jesus said. Not only reclaim that by word, but with actions and good deeds. It changes the way we think about our relationship with the world too. I believe that there are so many people out there doing exactly what we do. They don't consider themselves Christians. But we recognize Jesus in the way they live their lives. I said to myself in this preparation, in that case, there's no need for conversion. <laughs> we don't need to bring that person in to be like us because it's already been the life of Christ. I don't have to bring up Jesus' name every time I have a conversation at all because what we are sharing is shared in the spirit of the resurrection Christ from our perspective. They do good, we're doing the same, and we can see Jesus' life as they lead their own. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it. It sounds like that. <laughs> Gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. To help you um, expand your own reflections this morning, I want you to share with the person next to you something, a memory that your loved one or friend taught you and you are continuing to do that today. Either a recipe or how to swing the golf club properly. No, no. My father taught me how to put on a tie. Maybe when I was 12. And from that day until today, I do it exactly the way he taught me. And it helps me remember his face as he was standing in front of me and literally putting the tie on me. So every time I have a tie, put on a tie, I can see my father in front of me. The same way we live our life as Christians. Not necessarily with Jesus as on 450 million painting, but the Jesus that we recognize by his actions and his deeds. So I'll share with someone next to you uh, a memory or something that your parents or some of your friend taught you and you're still doing it today.
Does anyone want to share what you share with the other person? I was fortunate enough in secondary school, toward the end of that, uh, to be taught for a couple of years by uh, a fellow by the name of John Kennedy, who obviously coached the Hawthorne Footy Club and uh, learned a lot from John, a lot about uh, if you're going to do something, give it a good go. Doesn't matter if it doesn't work, if it comes out pear-shaped, but give it a good crack. And uh, don't regret not, uh, not trying. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Did anyone get a 450 million bank from a from a family member or a friend? <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, our singing group will be singing this song. Thank you, Lord.
offertory space may now be received. Loving God, we are reminded by the scriptures or the gospel this morning that we, we recognize the wounded Christ when the world is in pain. And so we offer this gift of mind and gifts out of our lives to show that you are alive with us, with our actions and with our deeds. Bless this gift of money, the gift of music, the musicians, and the gift of our lives and service, so that others may see your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. before and 
uh, with our little group, hearing how grandparents and family uh, model the faith of Jesus to me. So I was baptised into the Methodist family. And then, um, uh, when I was about 17, I decided that I had to make my own commitment. And that's, that's what happened. I came forward. And uh, uh, that was a turning point for me. Um, because I was about to head to uni. And uh, so I did architecture at uni. And as part of that, travelled a bit. And, uh, uh, but in that time, I was uh, a model of faith for me. It was very much uh, Reverend Bruce Pruer uh, over in that way. Really. And uh, I, I thank God for that model, that person in my life. Um, and he nurtured me as a young Christian. And, uh, but, but so my family did too, and the church family. Um, how are we going? <laughs> I don't know how much time I've got, but yeah, I'd, I'd say from there, uh, overseas, and uh, again, there were some very important um, youth ministers who uh, modelled Jesus to me um, uh, in a different culture to my own. And that was significant, uh, working class area. Um, and uh, so I thought, mm, when I come back, I'll, I'll keep going. I believe the Lord wants me to keep going with my study and become an architect. But I want to explore other possibilities too, training. And um, that's how it unfolded. 1977, um, big, day, big year, not so much for many of you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the union of the churches. And, and so I, um, that was the time that I, I married Diane, and um, uh, then candidated for ministry, see what would happen, and I uh, was accepted into that. And it was the first year of working as an architect as well, so it's a big year. Um, well, and from there, some more training and study, and um, met some friends overseas. Uh, this time, I first child born overseas, and uh, and then to Baroque in the Wimmera. Anyone heard of Baroque? Yeah, it's amazing how many here of Baroque, but never been there. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, in the Wimmera, and then down to Lilydale and team ministry, um, and then uh, to Whittlesea in the north side. So I was sort of going bush, you know, regional and, and uh, so on. So yeah, my situation was changing all the time. Um, last placement was um, 10 years ago, or longer than that, 2009. That was after my uh, first wife died of ovarian cancer, um, and I believe strongly there was a deep longing in my heart to um, work with and alongside Aboriginal peoples, and um, I've been there from when I was a boy. And um, so it was that I went in and served the church as a support worker at the Congress. Uh, in Central Australia for seven years. Uh, some wonderful things happened in that period, including meeting Sue. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we married in 2011. Amazing. Um, so what brought you to this community? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm, well, it's a long story, but Geelong was always Although I never lived in Geelong, Geelong was part of my uh, part of my yearning for working with Aboriginal people. Actually, um, we talk about the ancestors, the elders, and uh, I have some just listed there in that tablet. Um, 
So that's been the story, and uh, I felt that Geelong was my home country, even though I hadn't lived here. Um, Aboriginal people, for them, the question is often, where, where do you want to be buried? What is your resurrection company, where, a country? And I was quite moved and challenged by that, and I thought, I think maybe Geelong. So we came, and so it's proved, um, although not the way I may have expected. <laughs> uh, the song we were singing about joy and love in my heart, wish I'd had that last year, that song, because <laughs> I had major heart surgery last year. Jesus was in my heart, I was okay. Um, but just down the road. And, uh, you know, that's been like a turning point. I was 70 years old and a near-death experience, you could say. Um, the prayers and the love of so many surrounded me and um, it feels like Geelong, for both of us, we've come home. Um, we've been working in the Lane, and we continue to do that, um, North Shore. But uh, in terms of the worshiping faith community, here we are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's nice to have you with Sue in our midst. And the reason why I decided to introduce um, Peter to you today, I uh, invited him, if you were to take services in our communities and he kindly um, accepted the invitation. So it's good to know who you're worshiping with, especially when he's taking the lead. Um, and that's why um, we're introducing him today. Any other notices? Sue? I'd like to let you know two things this week. Um, the Wesley Sustainability Group is meeting on Tuesday evening. We alternate between meeting in person and on Zoom, and this is a Zoom meeting. And um, if you're curious about it, um, come and see me afterwards, and I'll give you the link and uh, show what we're going to chat about. And then on Saturday, I lead a group called Climate Champions, and uh, there are about um, all over 20 of us, uh, one person from each church all around this region, and we're coming in for an afternoon on Saturday, and I'd love it if any of you would like to join us, where we look at um, actions that we can take to uh, further um, making changes for our, for our civic and uh, elected leaders, um, and just enjoy being together and sharing stories about what we're doing in each of our churches. So a couple of things to let you know about. Very happy to talk with you afterwards about them. Thank you. Just a, a small thing, but the rosters, talking about people with gifts, um, the rosters for people who help to welcome, people who read in church, um, those who serve morning tea and communion only go till the end of March, May, sorry, May. So we need to develop another one for the next few months. So if you, I've got some sheets, if you'd like to see me afterwards, I know people have expressed interest in helping, I just thought I'd let you know about that. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Make me a general of your peace, our next song.
visit. Any partial sharing? That's partial man. Good morning, everyone. I have three things that um, I want to share this morning. Yesterday evening, there was an absolutely wonderful celebration of the life of Kathy Bond in the hall next door. There were well over a hundred people in there. The meal that people contributed was absolutely amazing. And uh, I don't know where the leftovers went, but it was incredible. But the most amazing thing about it is that there were so many nationalities represented there. Iraqis, Iranians, Sri Lankans, and so on and so on. And the tributes that were given in there to Kathy Bond were quite amazing and almost heartrending. The contribution that Kathy has made to looking after refugees, asylum seekers, just a sort of beggar's belief that she gave her whole life um, to other people. And it's no wonder that the Welcome Centre is going to miss her incredibly. And it's sort of the time where other people volunteering need to step up a bit to help to fill the gap. So I suppose there's a bit of a think about it whether or not that might be something that you can do. The other thing that was happening at the same time was that the Fijian choir was in here rehearsing. This is a wonderful place. So many people are welcome. We have said for many Sundays, everybody is welcome. And to be here last night was to see what a welcoming place this is. And somebody said to me, it is so good to have a place like this that we can come to and have a function like this. That all happens because you are people who are open to welcoming so many people. It encourages us as a church council to say yes to the many requests that we receive for use of the properties. And we will continue to do that. And the segue from that, which I chose to mention in caring and sharing this morning, rather than as a notice, is the election to church council. You know that nominations are open. In a prayerful situation of caring and sharing, I ask you to please consider whether the church council is for you. There are nomination forms outside. The nominations close next Sunday. Please give it your prayerful thought. And the third thing that I wanted to mention Hands up if you've heard of the Trefoil Guild. Some people have heard of the Trefoil Guild. It's not surprising that those hands that went up are from the ladies in the congregation. Blokes didn't know and I had to do a bit of research as well. The Trefoil Guild is an organisation um, where girl guides, ex-girl guides and those who were associated with guiding uh, joined together. What do they do? I was amazed when I look up, looked this up. Members support girl guiding in Australia and the community by actively supporting local and national charities, giving their time to support causes such as aged care facilities, Meals on Wheels, Red Cross, etc., Creating beanies for those experiencing homelessness and or premature babies, making breast cancer care bags or mittens for injured wildlife, and it goes on with all sorts of community service 
activities. So why am I mentioning this? A little bird told me during the week about somebody in the, our presence who you can now see as Judy Lyle. Last weekend, we recognised for what I believe is 60 years service to the Trefoil Guild. And she received the Golden Wattle Award. As Christian people, we serve the community in all sorts of ways. Judy, well done. Congratulations.
those who are making this place moving every Sunday morning. Uh, your contribution is much appreciated. All right. Christ be our light.